It's been said that your reputation is something you can only lose once. And when your trust and reputation are gone, you can't really get it back. On this edition of the program, we're going to talk about integrity, truth within ourselves and within our lives. Stay tuned. This could be one of the most vital shows you see this year. Don't go away. We're back after this. There's a story of Gandhi, who was a legend in his own time, very famous, and he was going to speak, and a mother came up and said to the famed Indian leader, said, look, my, my son is abusing sugar. He just eats sugar. And would you say to him, please don't eat sugar, because he admires you, he'll listen to you. And so when we come through the line, please just tell my son not to eat sugar. And Gandhi refused. He wouldn't do that. So about 30 days later, he was speaking in another city. And this time he told the mother, he said, I will, I will tell your son to stop eating sugar. And he did. And the mother asked him, said, well, why wouldn't you do this a month ago? And he looked and he said, well, I have to be honest because at that time I myself was addicted to sugar. And I just didn't think it would be right for me to tell your little boy not to eat sugar when I myself as an adult was abusing it. So he said, I took a month to get off sugar. So without being a hypocrite, I could tell your son what he ought to do. Now that's integrity. Now why does integrity really matter? The Bible says that God desires truth in the inward parts, really. And we have got to, with the help of the Holy Spirit, police ourselves and make ourselves people of truth. I was getting in the car the other day with a, a friend who was a donor to our ministry. And uh, he said, aren't you going to put your seatbelt on? And I said, yeah, I don't like to do that. And he looked at me shocked. And he said, well, the law says wear your seatbelt. You need to obey God in the little things. And you, you know, I felt conviction. I said, you're right about that. And I've been wearing my seatbelt ever since. And it starts with the little things because little things make up big things. You know, relationships, whether it be a friendship or certainly a marriage, a family, boyfriend, girlfriend, employer, employee, uh, church member, it doesn't matter. Relationships are built on trust. And if you're found out to be dishonest in something and trust is lost, I would argue it's virtually impossible to get it back to the level that it was. Now, bridges can be uh, built and fences can be mended, as they say. But when trust is gone, it's just nearly impossible to fully restore. That's why when the Word of God tells us to be people of truth and honesty, God's telling us to do that because he loves us. Now, when we come back, we'll visit with journalist and author Warren Smith, and we'll talk about the importance of integrity, not only in the press, but in the people in each of our lives. Stay tuned. We're back after this. Every daughter knows that her father is the most important man in her life. He is her first love. But her father doesn't know it because dads are maligned and marginalized today. Well, I have an answer for dads. My Strong Fathers, Strong Daughters Masterclass. It's a series of online videos I created to show fathers exactly what they can do to have better, closer relationships with their daughters. And men have told me that it's transformational in their relationships with their daughters. So no matter what your daughter's age, if you're a dad who needs encouragement and help, check out my Strong Fathers, Strong Daughters Masterclass. You can only find it on meekerparenting.com. The Word of God says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything beyond this, 
We're in jeopardy of sin and dishonesty. Hi, Alex McFarland here, and we're going to talk about that most vital of subjects, truth and being a person of truth. And I've got a, a friend and colleague of many years here with me, Warren Smith. And we're going to talk about truth in general, but also truth in the body of Christ. That's yep. very important. Alex, good to see you again, man. It's good to have you here. I want to thank you for driving up from your hometown of Charlotte. Yep. But more importantly, I want to thank you for being a person of truth. I've known you many years. I, Before you and I were personal friends, I had read your columns. And uh, I, I got to say this, it, it always struck me that you were a person committed to truth and because you're committed to the Lord Jesus, and I know that. But I remember early in, in our ministry, I was like, I want to live my life and run our ministry so that Warren Smith will never need to do an expose on us. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's funny. Well, and I, so far, <laughs> congratulations. Well, I so never have. Yeah. So. But let's go back to around 1987. I had been a believer like two years. I came to the Lord when I was in college. And uh, like a lot that went to this Bible study, we were trying to evangelize our friends and a juggernaut hit the American scene. And I'll just summarize in two words, Baker Swagger. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Warren, I would argue that the church, in, in the public per perception, we've never fully recovered. Is, is that a fair assessment? Uh, yeah, I think that probably is fair. Uh, they, because both those guys are still around, for one thing, and, uh -huh. and they're, so we can't really ever quite get past them. And uh, yeah, it was a huge deal. Uh, that, you know, the the PTL scandal in particular, the Jim and Tammy Baker scandal, uh, it was in, happened in Charlotte, which is now my hometown. I wasn't living in Charlotte at the time. The Charlotte Observer won a Pulitzer Prize for their coverage of that. It became national really? news. Uh, books have been written. Uh -huh. I, I, in fact, I've written one of them, Faith Based Fraud, my book. I devoted a chapter to that scandal, even really? though, as you say, it happened more than you know, almost 40 years ago now, wow. just because uh, it was such a defining moment, I think, in the uh, life of the evangelical church. Well, you know, um, America has been very blessed as a country uh, of affluence. I mean, we've had some ministries, and there are many ministries that have no trouble raising millions of dollars. Um, and, and now, you know, as I travel and speak, and I do a lot of secular radio, and people call in and they're like, well, you know, preachers, you can't trust them anyway. They're just living a big posh lifestyle. Um, raising money and having wealth is not necessarily a bad thing. But why does it seem like even within the people of God, it so often opens itself up to abuse. Yeah, it's a great question. And, and before I answer that question directly, and I promise you, Alex, I will get to it, I, I do want to say that the, and you know this, right? And I hope our listeners and viewers know this as well. The vast majority of Christian ministries um, are modest. Uh, their leaders are humble yeah. and leading sacrificial lives. The average church in this country has probably less than 100 members or right yeah. about 100 members. Um, you know, so when, so what, when we talk about these lavish lifestyles of some, of some of the preachers that we see in the news, I want to be really clear that they are a very, very, very small minority. Unfortunately, yeah. they do capture the headlines and they control the narrative of what's really happening in the church. But I believe, and then that's one of the reasons why we report on those stories at Ministry Watch is because, you know, we, we think that they need to be exposed. The Bible says that, you know, have no fellowship with evil deeds of darkness, right. rather expose them. Yeah. And so that's that's the reason we tell these stories. Um, but I, you know, I, I think that, um, that, you know, what's happening uh, in this country is, uh, you know, a situation in, in which confidence in all institutions is going down and that what we want to do is to create a higher level of transparency and accountability mm -hmm. with Christian ministries. And I'm not sure that I fully answered your question. Well, and, and I agree. I, I do think the vast majority of ministries, and I, I've been privileged to interact with many of the major ministries and sat on board. I, I think the vast majority are honest and ethical yep. and they're doing God's work God's way. But you, you're right, it is unfortunate when you do have the bad apple that uh, abuses and steals and does dishonest things, that, that's what makes the headlines, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. And, and I think to, uh, owning that, facing that, um, is, is the first step towards restoration. Mm -hmm. You know, even in our own lives, Alex, at, at a very personal level, salvation comes from the confession of sins and the repentance and the turning to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I think that as, at the corporate level, that principle should also be at work, that if we're not willing and able to 
face mm -hmm. um, the, the sin in our own camp, so to speak, and root out that sin, that I, I think that the, the outside culture looking in at the church will never really trust the message that we're bringing to them, the message of the gospel, which is the message of hope. They'll just assume that that message is not credible because they think the messenger is not credible. Well, well let's talk about your book, Faith-Based Fraud. Um, give me the premise of that book and really kind of what prompted you to write it. Yeah, I think uh, the, the, the premise of the book, first of all, is that, is that you know, we, through that book or with that, with that book as a tool and at Ministry Watch, we want to restore transparency and accountability accountability to the Christian ministry space. Sure. And we want to do that in order to uh, enhance the credibility of Christian ministries. That We think that sunlight is the best disinfectant. Mm -hmm. uh, we think that as Christians, we're children of the light, so we should walk in the light. And that's why we think that um, journalism can play an important role, especially Christian journalism, journalism that is informed with a Christian worldview, can play an important role in covering the church. I think it's important to note that a lot of the big scandals that we've seen in the past few years, including the one that we started our conversation with, Jim and Tammy Baker, but yeah. also, you know, what happened at Willow Creek and uh, Ravi yeah. Zacharias and, and oh, many know. others. And, you know, you and I are both friends. We're both friends with oh. Ravi, and it was just a real gut punch for us. It, it really was. When that happened. But it wasn't the board of directors. It wasn't a denomination. That uh, it wasn't the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability, even though I think they do great work, mm -hmm. that brought those scandals to the attention and created the reforms that were necessary there. It was journalism. It was outside journalists, some secular journalists. The Chicago Tribune, for example, yeah. was covering Willow Creek. Uh, we were covering Robbie Zacharias, Christianity Today, World Magazine. Uh, Mars Hill Church and Mount Driscoll was, uh, was a yeah. story that I covered when I was at World Magazine. So it really took journalism to um, bring those stories to light. And it wasn't until those stories were brought to light that there was any possibility of restoration in those situations. Well, you know, and it really does have repercussions because to this day, and I was just on the road last week, and I've had this question posed a number of times. Somebody came up and they said, you know, uh, I, I really had an experience with the Lord through the ministry of Ravi Zacharias. And, you know, uh, posthumously, a lot of very heartbreaking revelations came out about Ravi. And yeah. this person basically said, you know, uh, am I really a Christian? And obviously, I, you know, when I've had this question posed two or three times, I'll say, look, you invited Jesus Christ into your life. And you and I knew Ravi. We booked him in our events. Um, I don't mean to belabor that point, but here's the thing that I think all of us need to take to heart, whether you're in the limelight or you're in a leadership position or you're just a Christian talking over the back fence to your neighbor, people oftentimes make a judgment call about the authenticity of Christ by looking at the life of the Christian, don't yep. they? Yep, they sure do. And, and thus it behooves all of us to remember that we're, we're not our own. We represent Jesus. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I've, in fact, I've heard it said uh, by, my, by our good friend Bobby Conway, who does the One Minute Apologist. Sure. He says that, that uh, you know, the gospel is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but he said our lives are the fifth gospel. He sometimes calls our testimonies the fifth gospel. And Amen. I think that there's a, uh, an, you know, I'm not trying to elevate our lives to the level of the God's Word, yeah. but I do think that there's an important point there and that people do look at our lives. And I think they also say to us, the outside, you know, sort of questioning skeptical world, or, or maybe even seeking, you know, that there's somebody who is, uh, by God's grace, is, you know, looking at the gospel seriously. That, you know, they do look at our lives and they say, they say to us, you say, Warren, Alex, mm -hmm. that the gospel transformed. Mm -hmm. Why is your life not transformed? Yeah, or, exactly. is, or is your life transformed? And if they can see a transformed life, then I think that that goes a long way towards helping them understand that maybe this gospel that we're talking about could transform them as well. Yeah, exactly. And sometimes I think the lost world is uh, reticent to in engage Christianity because they look at Christians and they're afraid they're going to turn out like some of us. <laughs> right. you know I mean? Yeah, no, that's <laughs> right. But, but, I, but I, on the other hand, I think that there, there, that there is an antidote to that, and that is for us to be honest, yeah. for us to be honest about our own lives, to be humble 
about who we are as human beings, that we're, you know, that we really are sinners saved by grace, that the sanctification process is not complete, it is ongoing, and that we're going to continue to make mistakes. And that's why I think it's important for us to just own that, to be honest about that, to be honest about uh, our shortcomings with ourselves, uh, to be honest with us about, about our shortcomings in the uh, institutional mm -hmm. barriers that we put around ourselves, and also that we be honest about that with the watching world as well, so that they don't look at us and have the impression that we are holier than thou, that we're mm -hmm. pharisaical, that we're right. sanctimonious, but that we understand that um, you know we're human beings just like they are, and yet this Jesus that we talk about really can make a difference. I know you've done research on some churches, not just ministries, but churches. Uh, talk to us, because as you mentioned, uh, the average church in America is, you know, probably a hundred people or less. H.B. London, that you may recall, I his do. cousin James Dobson, I worked for. H.B. was, he really kept his finger on the pulse and he said, you know, if you've got 125 to 150 people, you're larger than most churches. But let's talk about what you've seen as best practices in the local church yeah. for transparency and accountability. Yeah. Well, t those two words, transparency and accountability, are so important to us at Ministry Watch, so we do pay a lot of attention to that. We, we think it's important uh, that, the, that the, at a church, for example, that there be, and, and I know every church is different, but that there be a, uh, a board of elders okay. or deacons or some kind of a leadership board. That oversight. Is, uh, of oversight. That, that is what we would call independent. Uh, truly independent. Now that that word has some technical meaning, but but what that essentially means is that there's no financial interest of the people. I mean, they might be donors to the church, but they're not getting paid by the church. One of the problems, for example, that we saw at Mars Hill Church, Mark Driscoll's church up in Seattle, Washington, was that they had a, a board of elders. There were probably about 35 to 37 elders, but more than 30 of them were actually on the church staff, so that it was very difficult for those elders to provide any level of real oversight to the pastor, the senior pastor, because the senior pastor could simply fire them if they you know, said yeah. something that the senior pastor didn't like. My so, goodness. so independence means that they don't have a financial interest that they can, in other words, tell the truth that they can fulfill their responsibilities as elders or as deacons without fear of financial not have uh, their, retribution, not have their objectivity compromised. Exactly right. And we also think that 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 board should be of an appropriate size for the organization. We recommend seven to twelve people for a board. Okay. Um, and there's all kinds of reasons that I won't get into, but uh, having a board that is too small is a problem because then the, the senior leader, the pastor, or the ministry mm -hmm. leader can manipulate those, those folks. Uh, if it's too large, it can also be a problem. That's what we saw at Liberty University where, and, and the American Bible Society. Mm -hmm. Those were two organizations that had very large boards, more than 30 people, in fact, close to 40 people at one point for mm -hmm. American Bible Society. And it made it very difficult for individual board members to speak up or to have any real influence on that board. So that's why we recommend seven to 12. So an independent board that has no financial interest in the organization, those are two really important, powerful um, uh, barriers that an organization or, or, or institutions that an organization can put in place to create transparency and accountability. Do you see the American church ministry? Because, you know, to, to the unsaved world, I mean, they don't see any difference between uh, uh, Franklin Graham and Samaritan's Purse and, you know, some uh, shyster, yeah. you know, doing things yeah. egregiously inappropriate. And they just lump it all together under religion. Yeah. Uh, but do you see um, a restoration of trust and accountability in the minds of the watching world? Well, I've got to be honest with you, Alex, and say not yet. But I want to be clear okay. with that word yet. I believe it's coming. I, I believe that what we've seen over the last uh, maybe 10 or 15 years with a lot of these scandals, um, the, you know, the clergy sex scandal in the Southern Baptist Church, uh, the breakup of the United Methodist Church, for example, um, I think what we're seeing is a separation. Of, of folks that want to follow God's ways and God's word and those who do not. And I believe that that, um, that is going to be painful but necessary. And I believe that those who do follow God's word and God's ways will ultimately thrive. The Bible says, uh, you know, if I be lifted up, 
I will, draw, Jesus, I will all draw all men to us. And I believe that, that those of us who follow Jesus, follow the way of the cross, follow His Word, will ultimately uh, emerge triumphant. The Bible promises, as a friend of mine says, I've read the last chapter of the Bible, and, and God we, wins. We, and, exactly. and the Bible also says that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And that's one Matthew of the reasons 16, why I don't believe 18. these scandals are okay. going to prevail against the church as well. Well, you, you know, you mentioned United Methodist Church, and we could talk about the PCUSA. But, yep. you know, there's financial integrity, there's moral integrity, but there's also theological that's integrity. Right. And, and I would, you know, perhaps this is another conversation for another day, just as uh, I would expect people to expect financial uh, integrity among their leaders, more, certainly moral integrity, but also if you're going to support a ministry or go to a church, you need to insist on biblical theological integrity. Well, that's exactly right. And that's one of the reasons that Ministry Watch, when we rate a ministry, we actually have a question in our rating process. Do you have a biblical statement of faith that you Amen. require your senior leadership to you know, sign on to? Uh, we think that that's really important. You know, Alex, as you and I have discussed before, uh, borrowing from Richard Weaver's book, Ideas Have Consequences, Amen. One, uh, you know, we think that theology has consequences as well. Oh. And that, that a lot like of... Like eternal the, consequences. It, it, well, they, well, obviously eternal consequences, but I think even and temporal consequences as well. I think that some of the sexual scandals that we see in the church, some of the financial scandals that we see in the church are because of flawed theology, that they're downstream from flawed theology. And that, um, you know, the, the, many of the excesses, for example, that we see in, in the prosperity gospel or in some of the legalistic um, uh, uh, rooms of the Christian, you know, homes um, uh, are the result of theological error. And I think that uh, teaching the, the Bible, teaching a biblical worldview is maybe the most, it's a long game for the church, well, it but is. it's the most effective thing that we can do. Well, and also we need to be truthful about salvation. It's not merely recite a prayer, then live my life. However, I, I mean, Jesus calls us to be disciples, That's right. which is a lifelong obedient follower. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I think we need to emphasize that more. It's not just, uh, I trust Christ and I'll go to heaven when I die. I am to live for Christ down here. Seems like Paul said, I die daily. Yeah. yeah, well, that's right. And, you know, and, and a friend of mine, and, and, and I, you, Alex, is, you've got more theological training than I am. You can unpack this. But a friend of mine says that salvation is in no way dependent upon works. It's by, you know, by grace alone. Um, however, once you have been saved, it's all about works. It's all about, you Amen. know, by, by your works, people will know you. By your love, they'll know we're Christians. So the, the way we live after we have, you know, prayed that sinner's prayer is bears evidence of the fact that, or whether that was a true salvation or not. Sure. Well, we've got to pull away. Warren Smith, I want to thank you Amen. for uh, being with us today. And we are to live truth. And we'll be back after this to discuss it further. And that's the truth. Don't go away. This is John. He's 21. He's never met Jesus. It's possible he never will. He never went to church. His mom doesn't trust them. How do you change his future? So let's find his public school and establish a Bible club down the hall. There, someone introduces him to Jesus, who takes his life in a new direction. John's so excited, he tells his friends, one of them comes to Christ. And it all began in a public school good news club. I'm just wrapping up 20, 21 days of speaking in half a dozen states. And I was talking to a man about his relationship with the Lord. And he said to me, he said, you know, uh, regarding heaven, he said, I guess I've got about as good a shot as the next guy. And the fact is he did, which is no chance at all because God doesn't compare us to our neighbor or are we as good as, you know, our best friend. No, the standard is Jesus Christ who is holy and perfect. But the good news is regarding lost integrity, sin, darkness within all of ourselves. The Bible says if we put our faith in Jesus, we're forgiven. And do you know what? The Bible says regarding integrity, that Romans uh, 2.16, that there's coming a day when by Jesus, God will judge the secrets of men. 
I mean, isn't that something? You think about that. We have secrets and God knows it. And the standard is not, uh, were we better than the next worst guy? The standard is, were we as holy as Jesus? Now, none of us are, but this really is good news because Christ died on the cross, rose from the dead. The Bible says if we put our trust, our faith in Jesus, the Son of God, then His holiness is attributed to us. This is amazing. And so your integrity can be restored, but even better yet, your standing before Almighty God will be all right forgiven, righteous, saved by putting your trust in Jesus. And if you need help in knowing how to do that, you can go to my own website, which is alexmcfarland.com. There's a tab. It says, what does God say about my relationship with him? Or if you reach out to us, we'll send you the book. We've sent thousands of others about our relationship with God. Hey, if you turn to Christ, he'll receive you and restore you. And that is the truth. Wow, I cannot say enough about the Karis experience. This is the best decision of my life. God is calling you here. He's going to help you. He's going to lead you in the right direction. You'll see the heart of Andrew. You'll see the heart of all the instructors. And the Lord will speak to you if you come. If you are desiring to come to Bible college, then you have a word from the Lord. God has something for you. Here, come. <laughs> Well, these are exciting days in our ministry, not only television and radio and the online social media things we do. I just got back from 21 days of speaking in six states. I was in front of hundreds of young people. In fact, one school in particular had 800 middle school and high schoolers. And let me say this, they're hungry for truth. We're talking about God and country. We're talking about the gospel, the evidence for the Bible. We're talking about America. And you know who uh, really are the most enthusiastic audiences that I'm in front of, teenagers. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful? And so I want to say thanks for those that help us do what we do. You know, there's a brand new book I came across called First Principles, The Founding Beliefs That Made This Country. And I want to send you this book for your donation of at least $40, a tax-deductible donation of at least $40. I'm going to send you this book that will help you understand what made this nation and what made this nation great. And these are things that we need to recover. You may give securely online at my website, which is alexmcfarland.com. Give securely at alexmcfarland.com or you can mail in a contribution at the address on the screen. And I want to thank all of you that partner with us. Look, it is making a difference. We're shipping out thousands of pieces of literature. We're in front of audiences of all ages, but especially young people. And let me just encourage you to go on the website viraltruth.com for our campus clubs. We're chartering new clubs all the time. We're helping young people know how to reach their friends for the truth about America and our freedoms and, of course, the message of salvation in Jesus, viraltruth.com. Look, this is a joint effort, and I want to say thank you for praying for participating and supporting. We're standing strong together, making a difference. And I say, may God bless you and may God bless America.